You're in logic class and the professor writes this on the board. You think, oh no, alien math. But it's just predicate logic. It says, everyone who clicked this video has exceptional taste in YouTube content. Predicate logic looks scary, but it's tight and precise. That makes it learnable. Let's break it down step by step. First, why do we even need predicate logic? If you've seen propositional logic, also called sentential logic or truth functional logic, you know it treats whole sentences as blobs. All pugs look funny. It just becomes a single letter. Call it A. But predicate logic lets us zoom in, like this. That makes it more powerful, because it can capture all these details of the sentence structure. So let's talk about sentence structure. In English, sentences are composed of a subject and predicate. The cat on the bed is sleeping. Or LeBron plays basketball. The subject picks out what you're talking about. The predicate tells you something about it. Some sentences are about a specific individual thing. Other sentences talk about a whole group. It's the difference between Taylor Swift is a songwriter and all songwriters are creative. For now, let's focus on singular sentences. Often, a sentence points at an individual thing by using a proper name, like LeBron James. Sometimes, we pick out an individual thing using what philosophers call a definite description, like the cat on the bed, or the world's best logic and philosophy YouTuber. Either way, the sentence points at one individual thing. That's what makes it singular. Enter predicate logic. Ready to get symbol-minded? Predicate constants are for properties or relations. We use capital letters, so is sleeping becomes just S, and plays basketball becomes P. Individual constants are for specific people or things. They're lowercase, so T for Taylor Swift, L for LeBron. We also have variables, X, Y, and Z, but save those for later. So in predicate logic, Taylor Swift is a songwriter. LeBron plays basketball. The cat on the bed is sleeping. Aside from the weirdness of reading right to left, that's not so bad, is it? Here's one possible confusion. You might say, wait, does S stand for is sleeping? Or does S stand for is a songwriter? Well, you are in charge of assigning letters, so S stands for whatever you want. But careful. In more complex sentences, if you already used S for is a songwriter, you can't use it again for is sleeping. That would cause confusion, and the whole point of predicate logic is clarity. So let's take a look at some more complex examples by combining sentences with truth functional connectives. Super quick side note. Logic notation is not totally standardized. I use this for and, but your textbook might use this or this. I use the arrow for if then, but your professor might use the horseshoe. I use this for negation. You might often see this. Don't worry. Predicate logic is predicate logic. What you learn here applies no matter what your textbook might look like. Just make the minor adjustments and you'll be fine. So, Taylor Swift is a songwriter and LeBron is not a songwriter. If LeBron plays basketball, then Taylor Swift is a songwriter. Either the cat on the bed is sleeping or Taylor Swift is sleeping. Remember, S can only mean one thing at a time. If we wanted to say that Taylor Swift is a songwriter, we'd have to assign that predicate a different letter. For example, W for writer. In that case, either the cat on the bed is sleeping or Taylor Swift is a songwriter. See the beauty of predicate logic? Tight, precise, no fluff. And now you're ready for the heavy hitters. Quantifiers. Unlike a singular sentence about an individual thing, a general sentence, like all group chats devolve into memes, is about a whole group. That's where quantifiers and variables come in. If I write x is g, the x is a variable, not an individual constant like t for Taylor or l for LeBron. It doesn't really stand for anything. So this gx here might say, for example, 
is good, with an empty slot. The X is just a placeholder. Behold the universal quantifier. It tells us how to read the variable. It looks like Martian hieroglyphics, but it just says for all X, or alternatively, for every X. Your textbook might use this, or this. No worries, it's the same thing. When we place the universal quantifier in front of GX, we get for all X, X is good. Everything is good. And this is the existential quantifier. It says there exists an X, or just there is an X. It gives a very different meaning to the variable. There is some X such that X is good. Something is good. We can also throw in the negation symbol to get a combination of different meanings. Not everything is good. Everything is not good. It is not the case that something is good. Something is not good. Quick detour. Whenever we use quantifiers, we have to decide what the variable ranges over. The universal quantifier says for all x, but does that mean for all x in New York City? For all x in North America? For all x on planet Earth? Philosophers call this the universe of discourse, basically the set of things we're talking about. Now most of the time, we assume the universe of discourse is everything, the universal domain. That means the universal quantifier covers rocks, stars, squirrels, YouTube influencers, everything in existence. That's the default setting. But later, we'll see how to narrow that down. So, quantifiers let us move beyond singular sentences like Bob is mowing the lawn to sweeping claims about the whole universe, like everything is good. But how often do you really want to make sweeping claims about the entire cosmos? More often, we just want to say things like all golden retrievers are friendly. So how do we symbolize a universal affirmative like this? Well, here's the right way. In logic speak, for all x, if x is a golden retriever, then x is friendly. All golden retrievers are friendly. Here's the wrong way. In logic speak, for all x, x is a golden retriever, and x is friendly. See what happened? This says everything is a golden retriever and friendly, which unless you live in a dog park paradise, is false. So rule of thumb, use the if-then form with the universal quantifier, like this. For all x, if x is a horse, then x is beautiful. All horses are beautiful. If you forget this rule of thumb and use the and connective, you'll end up saying things like, everything in existence is a horse and beautiful, and we don't want that. How about the universal negative, no superheroes are accountants? Well, this is a universal claim about all superheroes. So again, we use the universal quantifier. And according to our rule of thumb, we pair the universal with an if-then statement. Since we're talking about superheroes and accountants, let's go ahead and slot those in too. Okay, so far we have for all x, if x is a superhero, then x is an accountant. Obviously we need to include the negation symbol, but where? Here's where you've got to be careful. If we place it here, we get not all superheroes are accountants. That might be true, but it's not what we were trying to say. If we move it here, it says all non-superheroes are accountants. <laughs> Definitely not what we wanted. So let's try here. For all x, if x is a superhero, then x is not an accountant. Got it. No superheroes are accountants. The lesson? Be careful with your placement of the negation symbol. And remember, use if then with the universal. But sometimes we do use the and connective. For example, the particular affirmative, some cats are playful. Here's the right way. Notice the conjunction form. This says, there is some x such that x is both a cat and x is playful. Some cats are playful. Here's the wrong way. For complicated reasons I won't go into, the conditional is too weak here. It doesn't properly capture the idea of some. So rule of thumb, use conjunction with the existential quantifier. There exists a thing that is a cat and playful. Here is a particular negative. Some cats are not playful. Translation, there is an X such that X is a cat and X is not playful. Maybe your neighbor's grumpy tabby. 
Again, careful with the placement of the negation symbol. If you place it here, you end up with there does not exist some x, such that x is both a cat and playful. This guy might give off that vibe, but it just ain't true. All right, you now have everything you need to spot some logical equivalences. It's not the case that some superhero is evil, is logically no different from no superhero is evil. Batman approves. Or when I say, not all students are prepared, that's logically equivalent to some student is not prepared, which if you've been to college, checks out. Once you've got logical equivalences dialed in, you'll start seeing them everywhere. It's like Logic's version of hidden Easter eggs. A super short interruption and then right back to it. These videos take a lot of work, but if you find them valuable, supporting my work is easy. Like and subscribe. And if you're a student, send your professor a link to my work. I'd love for these videos to end up in your course materials right alongside the textbook. That's the best way to keep this project alive and growing. Thanks. All right, time to flex. You've got the basics down. Now let's crank up the difficulty just a bit. All students who show up to my early morning class are caffeinated and ready to go. Phew, that's a hard one. But this is clearly universal, so our cheat code will help. For all x, if a certain set of conditions are met, then it has such and such properties. Perfect. Now we have the skeleton and just need to fill in the details. We're talking about students. So if x is a student, then blah blah blah. But saying x is a student is not enough. Look, we're only talking about students who show up to my early morning class. Let's call that E for early morning, since we already used S for is a student. Now all we have to add is, for every x, if x is a student and shows up to my early morning class, then, well, then what? Two things. They are caffeinated and ready to go. Boom. There it is. One technicality. We need to add parentheses here and here for clarity. But there it is. All students who show up to my early morning class are caffeinated and ready to go. Let's try another one. Some cold pizza is delicious. The sum here is obvious, so we start with the existential quantifier. And again, let's plug in our cheat code. We know that typically the existential pairs with a conjunction. Now we just need to work it through. There is an x, such that x is a pizza, and it's cold, and it's delicious. Simple as that. Some professors want you to add parentheses here, but again, just make whatever small adjustments are necessary for your class or textbook. What about a mix of quantifiers, like this? If every student pulls an all-nighter, then somebody will forget to save their essay. We've got an every and a somebody, so we'll need the universal and the existential quantifier. We can worry later about how to connect them. For now, let's take each of them one by one. Every student pulls an all-nighter. Using our cheat code for the universal, that becomes for every x, if x is a student, then x is pulling an all-nighter. Sounds right, so let's move on. Somebody will forget to save their essay. Using our cheat sheet for the existential, we get there is some x such that x is a person and x forgets to save their essay. Now this does say somebody will forget to save their essay, but it could be anyone in the whole world, say Taylor Swift, though I doubt she writes many essays these days. But of course, in everyday conversation, you would just assume in context that somebody means some student in the class, not just anyone. So let's change this to is a student. Good. Now we have some student will forget to save their essay, which in context is what we wanted. One last piece. How are these connected? Well, here's the giveaway. If, then. So let's put our conditional connective right here and check the final result. If, for everything, if it's a student, then it pulls an all-nighter. Then, there is some student that will forget to save their essay. Boom. We nailed it. Not bad for a beginner. You can now talk about cats, pugs, superheroes, and sleep-deprived students, and do it all with alien math. <laughs>